joining us on the What Can You Do Right Now weekly workshop where we are helping you get relevant, practical information you can apply in your business today. Last week, we covered mortgage forbearance, self-employed loans, and more. And if you missed that, we'd be happy to share out that recording with you. Um, but today we have Jim, a certified business broker with Link Business Brokers. Um, selling or buying a business is a very complex process. It requires a lot of work to make sure that the structure of your business is clear and strong. It takes planning, coordinating, and implementing um, business enhancing practices. And Jim has, hold, has sold uh, hundreds of businesses in his career. He's an expert at problem solving with this goal in mind. Um, and we want to make sure that we are running businesses that are ready to sell. So uh, with that, Jim, I'm going to hand it over to you to chat about that. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Jim Moises. I'm a business broker. What, what is a business broker? You know, I'm a realtor for businesses. If you want to buy or sell a house, you call your friend, your cousin, your neighbor, someone you trust uh, to sell your house or buy you one. I do the same thing for businesses. So uh, for the people that have owned businesses, uh, I have yet to meet one person that truly hasn't thought about selling their business. Whether it's today, next year, five, 10 years from now, everyone sometimes during the ownership of their business, they have thought about, for various reasons, they wanna sell their business. Whether there is retirement, which is very popular now. Uh, people are sometimes move. Uh, there is a death in the family. Uh, if, for example, husband and wife and one of them passes away, the other one cannot run the business all by themselves. So they think about selling. Uh, there are quite a bit of partnership uh, problems or splits that come up. Um, you know, people go in with the best of intentions and it, the things don't work out with them and, and other different reasons. Uh, so unfortunately, most business owners that I come across now or for the past 15 years, very, very few of them, almost none have had it, an exit plan. They just say, okay, you know what? I had it, this is it. Well, another reason just to add is the COVID. You know what? That has affected almost every business out there. And most of them have been affected negatively with a few having actually had a positive effect, which we will talk about later on. And uh, when they decide to sell, uh, their window of um, exit is somewhere between six months to a year, sometimes even sooner which really doesn't give you a heck of a lot of time to prepare your business and yourself for, um, for maximum value uh, that you can get. So uh, the most important part of a deal, once you have a, a willing seller and a willing buyer, are the books and records. Everyone is going to say, how does books and records uh, look like? It becomes the finance part. Coincidentally, we are talking to the best bookkeeping company in Southern California. And I mean it. I have come across a lot of different companies. And I'm very, very uh, pleased and uh, pleasantly surprised with the way uh, Anna and the crew run the company. Uh, so it is important to have good practices uh, from the get-go, or if not from the get-go, for the past few years back to have in your book books. Buyers are always skeptical to begin with. And when they want to buy a business, they're even more skeptical. And now add to that post-COVID, that even makes it more. If you have a good set up books and records uh, from your bookkeeping crew at a crew, it makes it so much easier for me, 
for the buyer and for yourself. You don't have to worry about, did I miss something? Did I include everything? Do I show the correct profit and loss? Because what I use as a broker, I use your profit and loss and balance sheet to do a valuation for you. And if, if those are not accurate, guess what? My valuation is not accurate. And unfortunately, most of the times when there is inaccuracy is to your detriment. That means if your business is really worth half a million dollars, it'll show it's worth 400, 450, whatever it may be. So it behooves you to make sure you have all your books and records updated and then at, at your fingertip and, uh, and you review it, I will review it with you. And then if things need to change, uh, we could plan uh, ahead of time to improve on that area. So finance is a big part of it. Also, one of the other things about finance, um, if there is going to be a bank loan involved, SBA or otherwise just a regular commercial loan, there is nothing more important than your numbers. Banks look at your numbers. They don't care whether you're a nice guy, a nice gal, or anything at all. All they care about is, do the numbers make sense? Are they uh, accurate? And are they easy to understand? Uh, so that comes out a big part. Uh, next is, you know, your processes and procedures. Uh, in your business, regardless of what field you are, whether you have no employees or you have many employees, those process and procedures are really your big part of your goodwill. I'm going to buy a business and no one knows what they're doing. They are running up and calling and asking the owner how to do this, how to do that. That's chaos. Nobody wants to buy chaos. Nobody would even, in most cases, they wouldn't take over for free. So who wants to buy a headache? Processes and procedures are important. So depending on the industry, an employee handbook that explains each employee's or each position's description, their responsibility, and what, and what they are accountable for how to do things so generally speaking people say if you start training somebody today on any given subject at best they retain 30 percent at best 30 percent so if you have those procedures for review it would it would be probably the best money spent to have those easy to review whether they are on a simple to read pamphlet, a booklet, a video, absolutely. When I sell a restaurant and buyer is taking over and they are getting the secret recipe, seller is making something or talking about it, I tell them take out your phone and start recording. Because I guarantee you, I don't care if you're the best chef in the world, you're not going to remember everything he or she is telling you about the recipes. So record it for future uh, review. Uh, so once you have the procedures and uh, process down pat, we get to uh, training documents, which I kind of touched upon. Uh, training, training, training. You could be, you could have an employee with you for five years and 10 years. First of all, if that employee is a good employee, I would hope that there is a there is there are steps for growth for them. Very rarely a good employee will be stagnant and stay at the same position for long term. You want to give them an opportunity to grow with you. Depending on the size of your business, type of business, I always encourage some sort of an annual uh, sh uh, profit sharing. If I have something at stake, I'll work harder. For the Christmas time, 
get that extra 500, 1,000, whatever it may be, to help with the Christmas shopping. And, uh, it, you know, it's just about motivation. When you train an employee well, you're really motivating them. Uh, when you have procedures for them to follow, you are truly motivating them to excel. Which brings me to the next point, organizational chart. Well, if I'm on the bottom level employee and I'm making, I don't know, 15 bucks an hour, how do I know where can I grow? Can I be in a manufacturing environment? Can I be a lead machinist someday? Can I be an assistant to operation manager someday? And so on and so forth. Who is above me? Because that's where I want to be next. That's my next step. And uh, again, it all goes to keeping and retaining good employees, motivating them, and increasing productivity. Because if you increase your productivity 1%, only 1%, and if you have a payroll of, let's say, $20,000 a month, which is not that much at all, 1% a month comes out to $200, not a lot. A year, $2,400 a year. In a five-year period, over $10,000 more money in your pocket. And if you have ever owned a business, you know that every penny counts. Job description, I guess it falls into those uh, manuals that we talked about. I think we got, I got this backwards. Uh, job description from the get-go needs to be very clear. You have to go over them with the employee when you hire them or when they get promoted. Uh, sometimes we see employees get promoted and they are not looked after and they fall back. They become a so-so, not, not even a good employee then. And that's, uh, that's the worst thing you want to see. You want to make sure that you follow up in a new position as if they were a brand new employee. And uh, once you follow all of this, now you have a very, very attractive package for the potential buyer. Buyers will pay a premium for that ideal environment. I don't care what you do. Even if you are a one-person show, if you're working out of your home, but you have everything set up to go, when you want to sell, you get a premium over rather than just being all over the place and you know everything right up here, but it's hard to transfer. Hard to transfer. Can you go to the next slide, ladies? Okay. So... There's, there was a statistic, this is probably about 20 years ago, and I'm sure it's even more or higher. 20 years ago, they said 80% of the people making over $100,000, they did sales in their job. I would say that 80% is true for probably people making over two or 250 per year. 100,000 is a good amount of money, a lot of people make hundred thousand dollars now these years. So if you make, if you're making two two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year or more, very likely you're doing some type of sales. If you're a doctor, trust me, you're selling. If you're a lawyer, you're selling. I happened to go to my optometrist today to get my um, exam on my eyes. <laughs> they were selling me every moment every moment what are they selling me they're selling me their expensive uh priced frames and lenses and they kept coming back and back so sales is what you do in your business if you own a business you're in sales if you don't like sales become a w2 employee a, a business wouldn't be good for you but so sales has become even more important uh, today than it was even three months ago. Because coming out of the COVID situation, uh, 
what are your plans for growth? Uh, as I mentioned, I think most of uh, the businesses right now um, that are still open, they are hurting in, in sales. And just to get back in what we were talking, what I was talking about, uh, few, few businesses that I know, maybe 10% of the business owners I know, they're actually doing just as well, if not better than before. Why? They had done all the other parts we just talked about before. They had a plan for growth before COVID-19. They were looking to expand. They were proactive in their business planning. So you have to have plans for growth. And depending on your uh, type of industry, that plan can be more active or sometimes even semi-active and more passive. But you have to have some type of plan in place. If I can go down the list there, Jill. Uh, what about right now? Uh, what about right now? Everyone is nervous and uh, the good reason to be. Uh, what I have, what I have said to all my clients, if you are, if you're thinking about selling your business in the next one to three years, right now is the best time to sell. Why? If you are one of the 90% or so businesses that have had decreased revenue because of COVID, Right now, there is a reason to be optimistic and hopeful. You know what? Once we get to phase three, once we get to phase four, and we are full open, I'm going to get most, if not all, of my sales. What if you don't? What if you don't get all your sales? What are you going to say to the buyer then? What if the second wave, which is very likely to come anyway, regardless of which side of the spectrum you stand. The second wave will come whether we want it or not. It's just about what is our reaction going to be. Are we going to go to another shutdown? Guess what? If you are, your business will likely have um, irreparable damage to it, even if you can keep your uh, head above the water. If you can keep the doors open, you will have uh, quite a bit of decrease in your business in most cases. There are companies like Domino's. Their sales have gone up and will continue to go up as long as there is shutdown. I love them. Don't get me wrong. No, no, nothing against Domino's or those businesses. I have a client that is in the food, in the, in the restaurant business. Uh, it's not a Domino's but uh, it's a small local chain, his sales is up against last year because pre-COVID, he was delivering 60% of his revenue. Only 40% was in dining room or pickup. 60% was delivery. So he's, he's actually up against last year. Uh, the thing about now is you have to make a decision. Am I going to sell in the next three years or so, or am I going to stay put? If, you're, if, you have, if the answer is first, you need to get active today and put your business on the market because today SBA is willing to loan according to your 2019 numbers. So when we go to the bank to get a loan. In most cases, they will do a valuation on your business, just like they do on a property. And their, their valuation will be based upon your 2019 numbers, which hopefully is good. It's not bad. Six months from now, I guarantee you they're not going to look at 2019. They're going to look at 2020. And your valuation will be quite a bit less and you'll be lucky to even get a loan at all. So right now, 
that there is a question. If you decide to stay on, that's great. Uh, God bless you. All the power to you. Make sure you have a proactive uh, plan in place. Uh, I can go on for another couple of hours or days if you guys have time, but I'm open to any questions now. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so first, if, if anybody else has questions, I want to open that up and then I have some in my pocket, but I want to let you guys ask questions first. I have one in the chat. Um, someone asked, uh, what if I don't want to sell, but I want to pass my business on to my kids? What are some considerations with that? Tax. Um, that's way above my pay grade. I don't play CPA often especially when it's being recorded. But <laughs> uh, you need to talk to your CPA and tax professional to figure out the ramification. As a matter of fact, you need to do that even if you wanted to sell your business. Now, if you wanted to sell your business, I can help you to some extent. Uh, and I may be able to save you a few dollars on your CPA uh, session. But if you're going to pass it down to your children or you're just going to uh, do a sale to your partner between you, I strongly recommend to talk to your tax professional. Awesome. Any other questions from me, guys? Caitlin? Um, what are some potential pitfalls ahead when you're trying to sell your business? Not selling, I guess. <laughs> That's the biggest pitfall. Um, that question, actually, it gets magnified during the COVID period. There are already businesses that have shut down permanently. And that's sad. Because if I could have talked to them, I would have said, you don't have to open up, but at least try to sell the assets, whatever it may be. You still have some goodwill um, in there that you could walk away with some money in your hand. But unfortunately, a lot of people have sold, have already closed down. The pitfalls, um, your business will tend to get exposed as much as we try to keep it confidential, and we do our best to keep it confidential, but at the end of the day, if we don't tell people about your business, no one will buy it. So one of the biggest uh, concerns, but I'm not too worried about it because the, the, that's a myth. If people find out I'm selling my business, what happens? Nothing. What happens if you find out your logo, your local, burger joint is selling. Ah, okay. As long as the prices don't change much and the service and quality is the same, no one cares. But good question. I have a question. Um, I was part of a company that was acquired um, several years ago and uh, you talked a lot about kind of getting your uh, ducks in a row before you sell your company and the owners of the company I was part of um, you know, sold it and we had ways of doing things, but the owners came in and didn't totally understand. And it's not so much that it wasn't documented. It was just kind of a lack of understanding about how the business actually worked and how it was different from what they had previously done in a similar industry, but not quite the, in, the same industry. So what would be your advice in terms of um, acquiring a firm and making sure that that transition is smooth when you come into a firm that has maybe good processes, but you just don't totally get how it works fully? Like what, what's your advice for that? Uh, very good question. It brings me to a to a uh, situation that there was a brokerage, business brokerage office that was for sale. And somebody decided to buy it with absolutely no understanding of the industry and no experience in that industry. I said, and I told them right off the bat, don't do it. This is not going to work out well. And 
you know, I can't make decisions for people legally and morally. I don't want to do that. But I was rather adamant to them, told them not to do it. Guess what they did? And about a year later, they sold with, with losses. They lost about uh, 50% of their investment after only one year. So there is, as, as you're correct, Jill, if people, if there is a good documentation, there are procedures in place and people don't understand the business, you, know, you can't help those people. I'm sorry. There really isn't anything you can do. One of the other things that I would recommend is to have in that situation, to have a long-term agreement with the current owners to stay involved for maybe a year on a part-time basis for that smooth uh, transition. And when there, is a, when there is a broker involved, when I'm involved, I put that into place. I make sure that those uh, conditions are there before we close escrow. That's so great, Jim. I, I've seen a few clients over the years acquire or be acquired and the most successful iterations have always been where there was a handoff period between the previous owner and the new owners. And there's just, even just them being there as a resource for those, you know, random questions that maybe aren't documented or we're not really sure what to do when this one person calls for this one thing. Just having that resource helps make that transition not always perfect, but definitely a lot smoother. Um, so we are actually at time now. Um, so I want to put this slide up. If you guys have more questions, um, want to get in touch with Jim and kind of learn more about how to run a sellable business, what your business is worth, or maybe talk strategy if selling your business at some point in the future, or maybe right now might be a good fit. Uh, there is Jim's um, best contact information. Um, and if you want to talk about that finance part of it, there is my contact information as well. Um, and then next week, um, kind of piggybacking off of some of what Jim talked about, we are going to have Phil Chun um, focusing in on the piece of it that is um, people and processes and kind of talking about some best practices for that, um, as well as kind of some opportunities to improve it um, and to get some help doing that. So hope you guys join us next week. Um, thank you again so much, Jim, for, for sharing your expertise. I feel like I learn something every time I listen to you and I wanna go back and run a better business. So thank, thank you again. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone.